Greetings and welcome to this global conversation on the question of, is Indonesia still a model of religious pluralism and tolerance? This conversation is brought to you by my organization, the Religious Freedom Institute. I am Dr. Timothy Shaw. I am Vice President for Strategy and International Research with the Religious Freedom Institute. I also serve as the Director of the Religious Freedom Institute's South and Southeast Asia Action Team. Building on nearly a decade of research on religious freedom that I directed with my colleague Thomas Farr at Georgetown University, the Religious Freedom Institute was created in 2016 with one agenda, not a partisan agenda or a political agenda or a sectarian agenda, but a simple human agenda to promote religious freedom for everyone, everywhere in the world, regardless of creed, race, or nationality. Our research, including the research that I've conducted personally as a political scientist for many years, makes it crystal clear that religious freedom is a human cause because religious liberty serves as an indispensable foundation for free, secure, and pro prosperous cultures and societies the world over. There's a popular saying these days, no justice, no peace. The motto of the Religious Freedom Institute could be a slight variation and extension of that saying. No religious freedom, no global security. No religious freedom, no global prosperity. No religious freedom, no global democracy. It is because of the Religious Freedom Institute's combination of moral and analytical clarity about the foundational importance of religious freedom that I could not be more thrilled and delighted and honored to host this global conversation about Indonesia. As everyone knows, Indonesia is a country of profound and growing importance in our world today. Indonesia is the world's largest Muslim country. Indonesia is the world's fourth most populous country. Indonesia is the world's third largest democracy after only India and the United States. Indonesia is not only a literal group of islands as the world's greatest, largest archipelago with some 17,000 islands, it is also an island of freedom in an Indo-Pacific region that has swung in an increasingly authoritarian direction in recent years, not least because of the increasingly hegemonic aspirations of a rising China. The focus of our discussion today, however, is on yet another, though all too often overlooked way, Indonesia is of crucial and growing importance. We in the Religious Freedom Institute believe that Indonesia shows that a nation does not have to do everything right to be a success. A country does not have to be perfect to be prosperous and stable and resilient. Indonesia shows that if a country can establish a basic foundation, of religious pluralism, inclusion, and freedom, and if it can sustain these foundations over time, then it, be, it can become a remarkably strong, free, and prosperous society. Two immediate reasons explain why the Religious Freedom Institute is making the deliberate choice right now to explore this remarkable example of Indonesia, how Indonesia is a model of religious pluralism and tolerance. The first reason, and the most important reason, is that Indonesia is about to celebrate the 75th anniversary of its declaration of independence from Dutch colonial rule. This is an enormous milestone in Indonesian history. With this global conversation and webinar, we in the Religious Freedom Institute wish to say to all of our Indonesian guests uh, and our Indonesian viewers, Salamat Hari Karma Dekaan, Salamat Hari Karma Dekaan, Happy Independence Day, a warm and sincere Happy Independence Day to Indonesia. We believe it's a Happy Independence Day because Indonesia has achieved something significant and enduring over its 75 years, something that deserves far more global attention. The second reason the Religious Freedom Institute is having this conversation now 
is that simultaneously with the global release of this conversation, the RFI is launching a major new analysis of religious freedom in Indonesia, which we just completed a few weeks ago. Anyone now watching this conversation can go to the Religious Freedom Institute website, www.rfi.org, and download for free a copy of our brand new report on Indonesia. Our report entitled Indonesia Religious Freedom Landscape Report is unique in a number of ways. Many religious freedom reports are like the recent reports by the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, which paint with a very broad and very negative brush, even going so far as to put strongly democratic countries, such as Indonesia and India, on a similar level with countries such as Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, North Korea, and China. Reports such as these, we believe in the Religious Freedom Institute, foster narratives of negativism. That, we believe, foster a dynamic of defeatism in the fight for religious freedom. But our Indonesia Religious Freedom Landscape Report finds that a narrative of negativism and a dynamic of defeatism simply do not reflect the reality of Indonesia. Some countries have found some success in defeating religious extremists on the battlefield. But what we found is that even in the face of great challenges and determined extremists, Indonesia is successfully deploying a whole of society approach to engaging and defeating religious extremism, not just on the battlefield, not just kinetically, but ideologically, and in place of religious extremism, promoting religious pluralism, tolerance, and freedom. It is bringing government, culture, spiritual leaders, and civil society organizations into alignment and mobilizing them so that they can together push back against religious extremism and widen the boundaries of religious freedom and tolerance. Furthermore, our report found that a central player in this whole of society approach is Nalatul Ulama, the world's largest Muslim organization with some 90 million followers founded in 1925. The ANU has been a crucial defender of the country's religious pluralism historically, as we will soon discuss. And in the last few years, the ANU has become, if anything, an even more robust and creative advocate of a distinctively Indonesian vision of religious pluralism and tolerance. At the same time, our RFI report is honest. It is unsparing in its analysis of Indonesia's remaining challenges, its remaining shortcomings, and those forces that continue to threaten Indonesia's traditions of religious pluralism and tolerance. This combination of, on the one hand, Indonesia's unquestionable achievements, and on the other hand, undeniable challenges, takes us to the question that is the focus of our discussion now. Is Indonesia still, after 75 years, a model of religious pluralism and tolerance. And I am truly honored and delighted uh, that in discussing this critical issue, we are joined by four extraordinarily distinguished guests who have generously agreed to join our special Independence Day conversation, launching the Religious Freedom Institute's Indonesia Landscape Report. Our Guest of honor uh, and the, the uh, gentleman whom I'm going to introduce first, uh, we are particularly delighted to have joining us, uh, and that is His Excellency H. Mohammed Tito Karnavian, PhD. Uh, Your Excellency, Minister Karnavian, welcome. We're uh, delighted to have you with us. Minister Karnavian has served as Minister of Home Affairs for the Republic of Indonesia since 2019 and is therefore one of the highest ranking officials in the Indonesian government. From 2016 until his current appointment, Minister Karnavian served as chief of the Indonesian National Police. From 1999 to 2016, Minister Karnavian served in several law enforcement and security leadership positions in Indonesia. In addition to all of that extraordinary government service, Minister Karnavian is also uh, a analyst uh, and an expert uh, insofar as he holds a doctorate with distinction, magna cum laude, 
in strategic studies with a focus on terrorism and Islamist radicalization, which he received from the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore in 2013. He has also authored several books at the intersection of politics, policing, and security policy. And I uh, must say it's a remarkable uh, testimony to the commitment of the Indonesian government to this issue that Minister uh, Tito, uh, Pak Tito, His Excellency, agreed to join us and be part of a discussion with experts uh, and open conversation uh, about these issues. So we're particularly honored and delighted that Ms. Minister Karnavian could join us. We also very well, warmly welcome uh, Alyssa Kotrunada Munawaro Wahid. Ibu Alyssa Wahid is the founder and national coordinator for Gusturian Network Indonesia. Since 2011, she's quickly grown her community of social activists into the thousands, strengthening the landscape for a strong civil society in Indonesia and expanding representation to six countries. Founded on the principles of Ibu Wahid's father, the late great Indonesian president, Abdurrahman Wahid, or Gus Dur, as he is affectionately known, the Gusturian network aims to strengthen interfaith understanding, promote individual resilience, strengthen a culture of respect, and advocate for rights through public policy. She's a trained family psychologist and leads many grassroots initiatives and writes monthly for Compass Daily. Ibu Wahid also serves as Indonesia's Sustainable Development Goals Ambassador for Ministry and Planning, and she serves <clears throat> as the General Secretary of the Family Welfare Agency of Nadatu Ulama. Welcome to you, uh, Ibu Alyssa. We also have with us uh, my dear friend and colleague, Robert Hefner, who is a professor of global affairs and anthropology at the Pardee School of Global Affairs at Boston University. He is also, I'm honored to say, a senior fellow with our Religious Freedom Institute. During his extraordinary tenure, uh, Professor Hefner directed 25 research projects and organized 22 international conferences on religion, modernity, and world affairs with a special focus on religion, uh, rather, with a special focus on Islam and Christianity. He's authored or edited 20 books on related topics, many related to his research in Indonesia. Uh, last but not least, uh, we have with us another friend of the Religious Freedom Institute, uh, Mustafa Akial, uh, who is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity, where he focuses on the intersection of public policy, Islam, and modernity. A Turkish journalist and author, he worked for more than a decade as an opinion columnist for Hurriyet Daily News and the Middle East-focused Al Monitor Dot com. Since 2013, he has been a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times. He is the author of several books. Among his no most notable is Islam Without Extremes, A Muslim Case for Liberty, praised by the Financial Times as a forthright and elegant Muslim defense of freedom. Thank you, uh, dear friends, uh, and uh, thank you, Your Excellency, Minister Karnavian, very much for joining us for this discussion. In the first segment of our discussion, I'd like to focus on how exactly Indonesia has been uh, and why exactly it has been a positive model of religious tolerance uh, and pluralism. And I'd like to turn first to Your Excellency, uh, Minister Karnavian. Uh, and I'd like you, Minister Karnavian, to draw on your abundant uh, knowledge and experience uh, during all the phases of our discussion. Uh, but in this phase, I'd like to ask you, in view of your strategic position in the Indonesian government, to set the stage for our discussion by talking about the foundational ideology of Indonesia, uh, Pancasila. Uh, and I'd like to ask you to tell us why it creates such a strong foundation for religious tolerance and religious freedom. And I'd like to just note that some countries have had foundational ideologies that have simply faded away or have lost their legitimacy over time, sometimes because these ideologies were imported, ideologies of secularism or Marxism come to mind. Uh, but the foundational ideology of Panchasila has not faded away, clearly. Uh, so 
Uh, I'd like you to say a bit about how important this ideology is as a foundation for religious tolerance uh, and pluralism. Your Excellency. Thanks so much indeed, uh, Dr. Shah. Uh, I would like also to greet everyone here. I'm not sure whether it is a good evening or uh, good afternoon because we have got a time difference. But thanks very much, Dr. Shah, for your kind introduction. Well, being straightforward in relation to the foundations Pancasila. Pancasila is one of aspects to bring all Indonesians together as a nation. So religion was uh, respected very much above other issues. That's number one, belief in one God. So everyone in Indonesia, they must have religion. Even your national identity card or passport, you have to identify your religion, unlike other secular countries. That's number one. Number two is that uh, humanity, just and civilized humanity, because human is very important as well. Human right is very critical. And number three, the unity of uh, unity in diversity. Again, to underline, it's very important to unite on the very multi multicultural and diverse community, diverse society in Indonesia. Number four, democracy. So Indonesia is not never be and never going to be an authoritarian country or oligarchy because, because of the platform of Pancasila, the ideology already stipulated very explicitly, number four is that democracy. And number five is social justice for all people of Indonesia, regardless religion or ethnicities or again, uh, racial backgrounds. So it, Pancasila gave us very strong foundation to unite all people of Indonesia, 17,000 islands, three time zones sim similar to United States. And number three, in my opinion, even though Indonesia uh, being dominated by uh, Muslim, and in fact, more than 80% of Indonesia is Muslim, but the strength of Islam in Indonesia is different from the one in, in the Middle East. In Middle East, the strength of Islam, Islam was introduced by, by sword, by conquer. But in Indonesia, it was introduced by Arab traders, Indian traders from Gujarat. So they introduced Islam by words, not by swords. So by words means they approach and they, they adapt to the local cultures. That was Hindu and Buddhism, Hinduism and Buddhism at that time. So the strength of, is, of Islam in Indonesia is uh, then being coined as the syncretic Islam. Now, the Lama is one of the biggest of the syncretic uh, 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 strand of Islam. So again, Islam being adapted to the local cultures. There are a lot of practices uh, which are quite a bit different from, from other, the strand of Islam in the Middle East. So this is the peaceful Islam because Islam was introduced in Indonesia by peace measures. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Dr. Shah. Terry Makasi, Terry Makasi, uh, Your Excellency, that was a, a masterful, extraordinary, comprehensive uh, account of the history, the culture, the religion, the law, uh, and the contemporary politics that helped to undergird uh, Indonesia's experiment in religious tolerance and pluralism. 
thank you very, very much. I'm now going to turn to uh, my friend, uh, uh, Ibu uh, Alyssa Wahid. Uh, uh, Ibu Alyssa, we heard uh, mm -hmm. Minister Karnavian talk about the history of uh, Indonesia going back 75 years. And of course, I can't help but uh, uh, smile when I think about the fact that uh, it was your grandfather who played a crucial role in uh, the mm -hmm. original constitution uh, that mm -hmm. Minister Karnavian just described uh, exactly 75 mm -hmm. years ago mm -hmm. this summer, uh, precisely 75 years ago in the lead up to August 17th, 1945. Uh, and of course, exactly 20 years mm -hmm. ago, your father uh, was yes. president of Indonesia uh, at, at a very crucial uh, transitional stage. So your father mm -hmm. and your grandfather uh, were pivotal players uh, in the founding and in the sustaining of uh, Indonesian religious uh, pluralism mm -hmm. and tolerance. Uh, I realize this is a huge topic uh, and uh, to have you here uh, is an extraordinary honor because you could uh, you could speak for hours, I'm sure, uh, about uh, not only your father, grandfather, you're also your mother, uh, all the ways mm -hmm. in which your family played a crucial role here. But if you could just mm -hmm. give us a, a bit of a snapshot uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the, the the role that uh, your father and grandfather, as leaders of the Nadal to Ulama, of course, yeah. uh, played mm -hmm. in the founding and the sustaining of Indonesia's religious pluralism and tolerance. Terry Makasi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shah, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, greetings from uh, the slopes of Mount Merapi. Uh, so I think uh, the most important reason why major, uh, major religious communities support Indonesia as a democratic state is because Indonesia is blessed to have religious leaders who live in the practice of substantive, inclusive uh, a kind of religion. So they think of religion uh, as the, the substance, uh, substantive uh, way of life and worldview, and that leads to the understanding of Indonesia as a diverse, uh, or Nusantara, or the archipelago as a diverse uh, uh, soil. Uh, and that it's actually, it's, it's not only about my uh, grandfather, uh, Kiai Wahid Hashim was actually the extension of his father, who was the great leader of NU, of Nahdlatul Ulama, uh, he was the one chosen, and then because he's he's, uh, he's too senior, then he delegated uh, the position to his uh, son, uh, Kiai Wahid Hashim. And in October 1945, for example, Kiai Hashim Ashari, uh, the, uh, the 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 father of uh, Kiai Wahid Hashim, was the one uh, um, was the one. Uh, uh, proclaiming Resolusi Jihad or the Jihad Resolution, uh, calling out for a Jihad defending the infant republic at that time from uh, Allied forces. And that was the time making it official for NU to embrace the Indonesian Republic. Uh, Kiai Wahid Hashim, of course, is involved in the preparatory, preparatory committee for Indonesian independence. And he was the one at the forefront when they were trying to negotiate where, uh, the place or the position of the Muslim society within the Indonesian uh, state. And he was the one uh, acknowledging that, yes, we would become an, an Indonesian Republic, a Republic of Indonesia, a democratic state. And then, of course, President Wahid continued uh, this legacy. Uh, he fought and led democratization process in Indonesia, both as religious leader of Nahdlatul Ulama and a champion of democracy and civil society or social movement, and later on as a state person. Uh, he cemented uh, civil supremacy and supremacy of law. And uh, of course, the one of the pivotal uh, moment is in 1984, uh, when under his leadership, uh, Nahdlatul Ulama embraces Pancasila as a national ideology justifying that Pancasila is compatible with Islam. I think uh, pa, uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Hafner would be, you know, uh, more eloquent to talk about my father than I am because I'm of course uh, partial. 
Uh, but this long tradition and um, paradigms within Nadatul Ulama has become a true value and has been instilled in every layers of the mass organization. Now, uh, currently around 39% of the Indonesian Muslim society uh, proclaim that they are affiliated with Nadatul Ulama. Uh, so it's about 39% out of 210 million uh, Muslims in Indonesia, and that give you 90 uh, million. And if these 90 millions are every time they are in a mass uh, meeting, they proclaim hubul waton minal iman, because that's the belief, the fundamental belief that is taught to us, uh, that to love one country is actually an act of religiousity. To love a country, uh, to love one country is part of one's faith. And, you know, in NU, we even have an anthem, uh, Yalal Waton, Oh My Country, uh, where every members of NU, Nahdiyin, they would proclaim that Indonesia is our um, jewel of my heart, is the jewel of my heart, all those kind of things. So this, um, this, this really strong, uh, this really strong uh, sentiments is living is a living value within uh, the Indonesian Muslim society, and I know that NU is not the only one. That is why uh, just last year, NU uh, ruled a fatwa that said, in a democratic society, in a democratic society like Republic Indonesia, the term kafir or infidel is not relevant. That's how much we uh, uh, we're trying to uh, to 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 uh, balance between religiousity and nationalism, because uh, uh, Kiai Hashim Ashari once said that nationalism and religious are actually uh, 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 strengthening one another. It's not against one another, but it's strengthening one another. And Indonesia is a diverse uh, country, and we accept that from the very beginning, and we pledge uh, our uh, nationalism to Indonesia as part of the faith. That's, I think, the the most fundamental values that uh, Indonesia uh, that that Nahdlatul Ulama uh, holds dear, and that's why we said that um, Nahdlatul Ulama is probably the satpam uh, satpam of indonesia satpam is the uh, girl the uh, the girl of indonesia we are proud to be <laughs> the girl of indonesia in in uh, every aspects of indonesian life uh, whether it's state or non-state um, aspects i think i think uh, i can leave it at that dr shah and we can continue later on that's perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Terry Makasi, uh, Ibu Alyssa. Uh, that was magnificent, extraordinary, uh, compact uh, description of the, the critical role that your father, grandfather, and the Nadal to Ulama has played uh, in strengthening Indonesia's traditions of religious pluralism and tolerance. Um, I'd like to turn uh, to uh, the the, uh, the great Dr. Hefner <laughs> that you just mentioned. Uh, 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 Ibu Alyssa. Uh, uh, Robert Hefner has been a scholar, uh, an observer, a, a, a lover, if I may say, of Indonesia for many decades. Uh, and uh, um, most of what uh, little I know about Indonesia is thanks to, uh, to dear uh, Bob Hefner. Uh, so I'd like to ask you, uh, Robert Hefner, you've uh, followed Indonesia over many years. You've seen Indonesia go through ups and downs. And I'd like to ask you, um, what's your current assessment, um, uh, Robert Hefner, concerning Indonesia as a model of religious pluralism uh, and tolerance? Clearly, it has had uh, its ups and downs. Uh, clearly, there have been worries about, for example, the treatment of non-traditional uh, religions or treatment of religious groups that are not 
amongst the six official Agama, uh, the six official religions. There's been concern about indigenous spiritual movements. Um, uh, and with respect to these and other issues, uh, what's your assessment now of where uh, things are and where things are headed, uh, Bob? I, I wanted to begin by thanking you, Tim, and uh, thanking uh, uh, Menteri yang kami muliakan, Pak Karanavian, who is not just a great minister and was not just a great uh, chief of police. He is a remarkable scholar uh, of, of security, of police affairs, and of international Islam in his own right. I think it's a testimony to the kind of country Indonesia is and to uh, the kind of government that Indonesia has currently that it would have a person of such uh, extraordinary intellect as well as practical expertise as uh, Karanavian as his Minister of Home Affairs. So thank you very much, uh, Pak Karanavian, for joining us. I have to also just thank you. Thank you. I also want to just give a shout out and a deep expression of uh, of appreciation for Bu Alisa, who is a long-term friend and someone who has, in her own right, uh, created a career and a personal profile as uh, a major contributor to Indonesian civil society, to interreligious relations. She, of her father, of course, her father and her mother, I knew well, they were dear friends. They've been to my house perhaps 12 times, 13 times. Uh, so uh, again, uh, it's a great, great uh, pleasure to join you here. And Pap Mustafa, Akil, thank you for joining us. You're somebody whose uh, editorials and analysis I've always greatly, greatly enjoyed. Jadi selamat malam semua, selamat malam saudara-saudara, bapak-bapak, ibu-ibu, dan saudara-saudara semua di Indonesia. So I give my greeting to everybody in Indonesia in particular. Let me turn now very quickly to the question that Tim, that you gave. And again, thank you, Tim, for inviting me here. Uh, is Indonesia, uh, is, it, is, it, is it doing well? How is it doing? I think Indonesia is remains one of the most impressive democracies in the world. It is impressive not because it hasn't had challenges and difficulties. All democracies do. The United States has shown that it too, today, and in, for many years, has had shortcomings in its ability to fulfill its promise of liberty and freedom and equality. Democracy is not a panacea. In the, uh, the United States shows that, but that said, Indonesia is now 20 years into a remarkable democratic transition. Uh, I happen to be a comparativist with regards politics around the world. Indonesia is without question uh, the most remarkable Muslim majority democracy in the world. There are others, there are Muslim democracies, the Muslim world is very complicated, but I believe no country has overcome such challenges and achieved such a remarkable democratic achievement uh, as has Indonesia. And it continues. I think uh, Pak Karanavian and Bu Elisa both pointed to several things, several clues as to why Indonesia is doing as it is. Uh, it has to do with the remarkable nature of kabangsaan or nationalism in Indonesia. And the nation in Indonesia, as Pak Karanavian explained very well and as Bu Elisa did as well, it's based not on one ethnic vision. It's a multi-ethnic and multi-religious nationalism from the start. Were that were it just in principle and not in practice multi-ethnic and multi-religious, we of course would not be talking about Indonesia as in any sense a model. But the reality is, is not only did Indonesia begin its national career as this multi-ethnic and multi-religious country, but it has continued to develop a national culture, which you see all over Indonesia today. When I, 40 years ago, first went to East Java, I used Boso Jawi, uh, Javanese in my daily interactions because most of the villagers among whom I worked could not speak Indonesian. Today, all across Indonesia, you have a national culture and more uh, and a national language, and you have a pride what really marks Indonesia, what many of my Middle Eastern Muslim friends, when they visit Indonesia, tell me they're astonished by the pride and affection 
that uh, all Indonesians and Muslim Indonesians as 87% of the population uh, feel. I think Bu Elisa referred to that as well, and the great role that Nafdat Ulama played in the affirmation of the compatibility of, of Islam, not just the compatibility, the, the, the great beauty of Islam and nation in Indonesia. So all of those things, I think, are part of the Indonesia formula. I'll end just with one quick observation. Yes, there are challenges. We have uh, a, a ministry of religion that recognizes six religions and then also recognizes indigenous religions. Many people have for many years hoped that there would be a somewhat greater or somewhat uh, more uh, a richer embrace of indigenous religions. And again, a major testimony to the continuing evolving national culture that Indonesia has, and also the wisdom of the national administration and the national legal system is that oh, since 2017, we've had a series of both court rulings and also administrative implementing policies from the Ministry of Religious Affairs, from the Ministry of Education, and from the Ministry of Interior that has accommodated the 1% or slightly less than 1% of the population that practices indigenous religions. This is an achievement that is paralleled in very, very few countries, including Western democracies. Uh, Indonesia, again, in so many regards, is yes, uh, an extraordinary nation in making and a nation to celebrate. Thank you. Thank you, Terry Makasi, uh, uh, Pak, Robert. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for that. And I hope that as we proceed uh, in our conversation, we can talk even a bit further about some of the developments you mentioned concerning the Alaran uh, Kepercayan, uh, the indigenous spiritual movements, and the, the the loosening of restrictions on those since 2017. Uh, uh, Mustafa, uh, you have uh, made a career of thinking deeply about the Muslim world comparatively. Uh, as an analyst, you've also thought deeply about the evolution uh, of uh, Muslim uh, thought. Uh, and I'm very eager to get your reactions to the, the proposition that Indonesia uh, is as remarkable as our, our friends have uh, observed in the course of the discussion uh, thus far. Uh, and you yourself have been unsparing in your criticism of the Muslim world uh, on various matters including, for example, the respect for religious minorities. And I'll just note that you, know, you have been particularly courageous, and I salute you uh, for repeatedly condemning the persecution of religious minorities, including Christian minorities, uh, in, uh, in your own country, Turkey, and other countries. And here on this one issue, if we compare Indonesia to Turkey or Pakistan or uh, mm -hmm. Egypt, we, we just immediately confront a remarkable fact. If you look at the percentage share of uh, the Christian population in countries like Turkey, uh, Pakistan, uh, Egypt, uh, 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 even Lebanon, uh, the Palestinian territories over the last 40, 50, 60, or even more years, we see an almost consistent trend, uh, a virtual collapse of Christianity. Uh, I believe uh, in uh, the founding of Pakistan, something like 20 three or 24 percent, according to our friend Farhanaz Bahani, uh, uh, of Pakistan's population was religious minority, large community of Christians. Christians are now uh, something like only two percent of Pakistan. And of course, in your own country, Turkey, we know the, the horrible story uh, from uh, before the end of the Ottoman Empire to the present. And we see an even further uh, uh, kind of evolution of that history in an unfortunate direction with what has just happened to the Hagia Sophia, which you've written very sharply about. So just from your point of view, uh, how, does, how does Indonesia look uh, compared uh, to, to these other countries with respect, with respect to that issue, but with respect to, uh, to any other issues you'd like to talk about? Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, first of all, salam alaikum to all of you on the panel, and of course, everybody who's uh, watching us, peace be upon you. Uh, and I should say it's a honor for me to be on such a panel with uh, His Excellency, Mr. Karnavian, uh, Alisa Bahid, uh, Bob, and whose work I respect, Bob, I respect a lot. Um, I'll say a few things. I never had the chance to visit Indonesia uh, in my life, uh, although my book was uh, translated and published in Indonesia several years ago. 
But I had a, I went to Malaysia about half a dozen times, and my friends in Malaysia were telling me sometimes Indonesia is freer than us, and it's better, it's easier to speak about uh, issues on Islam in Indonesia. So, so they were admiring uh, more the broader range of freedom they found in Indonesia. In, in terms of being able to discuss some important issues relating to Islam. So that's a value, and please, uh, Indonesia, keep it. You know, it's a, it inspires other Muslims around the world. I'll say one thing. Five centuries ago, nobody criticized our civilization, the Islamic civilization, for religious freedom problems. Because we were better. We were better than uh, other civilizations. Actually, in the, in the 1600s in Europe, you find writers like Jean Baudin, uh, who argued for religious freedom and toleration in Europe, which wasn't very uh, popular at the time. And he points it to the Ottoman Empire, saying that, why can't we be like the Ottomans? They allow different churches to exist in Istanbul while we persecute Catholics or Protestants, depending on where we are. Uh, but so we were actually ahead of the curve in the value of religious freedom and freedom in broader sense. But in the past four centuries, the world has changed dramatically. Uh, a part of that change is colonialism, which is of course an ugly heritage of the West, and we're happy that you know we got rid of that. But there's also a bright side of that change. I, Human values like freedom, toleration, human rights, these values advanced. And they had profound influence on the world. Uh, let's not forget that slavery was abolished only in the modern world. And the idea began in the West, unfortunately, not in the Muslim world. It began in 18th century England and then spread. America was a bit late uh, for catching up. And we Muslims got the idea of abolition of slavery from the West. Luckily, we got rid of it as well. So some important things have happened. And in my view, in these past few centuries, while the Western world, Europe, North America, became much better than what it was, uh, because you know, inquisition, burning the witches, persecution of different sects, all these things have become history in Europe. And the idea of equality and freedom became established. So things got better. In our part of the world, things got even worse than what our classic age was uh, signaling or exemplifying. Uh, the clear example of that, I mean, is like the destruction of Middle Eastern and Christian communities. Uh, the Armenians lived happily and safely in the Ottoman Empire for five centuries under Islamic rule. They were not equal, but they were tolerated until they were wiped out in early 20th century, most of them from Anatolia. Uh, a lot of Christian and Jewish minorities in the Middle East were wiped out, persecuted, they, they, they disappeared in the 20th century. When the world's leaders were getting better, our leaders were getting less, uh, less uh, right. So we have a problem here, really, uh, as we Muslims should understand, because on the one hand, we are preaching that Islam is a religion of peace and tolerance, and these are true, as a Muslim myself, I believe in these values. On the other hand, we have some ugly realities in our recent past and, and in our current reality. And these ugly realities are, on the one hand, extremist groups, terrorist groups, of course, that is the most disturbing problem, but lack of also uh, full equality, really, Freedom and non Muslims find, or Muslims with different points of view. I mean, uh, in a Muslim majority country, Shia Muslims might have a problem, it could be the other way around. So I think we need to think on these issues. And I personally have done a lot of work uh, referring to scholars, of course, knowledgeable scholars. For example, the whole idea that Islam should dominate a state and impose religious practice and give only limited rights to non-Muslims can be criticized from an Islamic point of view. When you look into the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, this, you see that the first state he founded in Medina was actually not an Islamic state. It was a state where Muslims and Jews had the exact same rights. In the state of Medina, Muslims and Jews made one ummah, one nation. So that sounds very similar to the idea of a 
the holistic uh, nation that our friends from Indonesia are cherishing. Uh, and, and you see that in the constitution of Medina. But Muslims didn't pay much attention to the constitution of Medina for centuries because it was an age of empires. Empires wanted to expand. And they did with the sword, uh, as our uh, dear minister uh, Karnavi reminded. And it's important that indeed Islam came to uh, Southeast Asia not with conquest, but, uh, but with merchants. So the Muslim world is struggling with these issues. And as a Muslim myself, I believe that we, on the one hand, have to remain true to the core of our faiths, but we have to be critical of some of the aspects uh, in our tradition, which is, to me, doesn't come in from the faith, but from the historical experience. The idea of establishing empires that spread the faith through the sword, sword to me, was just medieval politics. It was not the core divine message of Islam. So we had to work on these issues. And people like me are working theoretically. There are many scholars, uh, activists, uh, thinkers, intellectuals working on these issues. But it's also important to have examples. We can say, look, the idea of freedom, the idea of tolerance works in this Muslim country. And it is good for that country, for the Muslims of that country, and for the non-Muslims of that country. Therefore, I applaud all the positive steps Indonesia has taken over the decades. Uh, I applaud the doctrinal steps uh, organizations like Nahdlatul Ulama have taken, such as not using the term kafir to all the non because the kafir is someone who sees the truth but intentionally denies it because of arrogance. Whereas a lot of non-Muslims are just honestly, sincerely following their faith as, as Muslims are doing. So I've written about that a year ago. So to my Indonesian friends, I would say, please uh, preserve your pluralistic and tolerant traditions and further advance them so Muslims around the world can look and see and say, wow, Indonesia is doing it, why not us? Because we have some bad examples for sure. We need more good examples. And I'm glad that Indonesia, with some problems, you know, is offering a bright uh, picture. And as a Muslim myself, I'm proud to see that. I'm a, as a Muslim myself, I'm quite too proud to write about that. Uh, and just let's make it better and better. Thank you. Mm. Thank you very much, uh, Mustafa. Uh, 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 outstanding reflections. Uh, uh, and if I may say so, I, I think we can be assured that Minister Kanavian can guarantee that you'll have a better experience uh, in Indonesia than your last experience in Malaysia. Uh, so we, we, we won't say any more about <laughs> your last uh, time I trust that. Thank you. Yes. In, uh, in Malaysia. Uh, <laughs> uh, even apart from uh, His Excellency's uh, personal uh, interventions, you would, I'm sure, have a better time. Well, and it's worth just pausing to, 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 to point out that. Uh, it, it really it is, you know, a case here of the proof is in the pudding. Uh, religious minorities are often re referred to as the canary in the coal mine. Uh, Lord Acton said that the 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 best test of of how a free a country is uh, is the security of its religious minorities. Uh, and by that test, Indonesia really does remarkably well. Uh, Robert Hefner has written uh, that since uh, uh, Indonesian independence the national share of the population of the Christian community has not only held steady, it has actually tripled. Uh, the Christians are, are three times the share of the national population today that they were in 1945. You had people converting to Christianity in this majority uh, Muslim country, which is truly uh, remarkable. Uh, a remarkable testimony to just the reality and the atmosphere uh, of uh, tolerance and freedom for uh, religious minorities. Of course, as uh, His Excellency Minister Kanavian already said earlier, uh, we know that Indonesia is not perfect. Uh, and uh, if, if anyone uh, calls to mind uh, uh, problems that Indonesia has had uh, in the last few years, they immediately would think back to the events of 2017, I suspect, uh, when uh, Indonesia saw a massive mobilization uh, against the governor of Jakarta, uh, who is uh, affectionately known as uh, Ahok. Uh, and in the Ahok affair, uh, the governor of Jakarta uh, was uh, 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 tried, uh, found guilty for uh, a, a blasphemy, uh, uh, of course, lost the uh, uh, elections, it was, well, was removed from the governorate, 
And I want to actually turn now to, to you, Your Excellency, uh, Minister uh, Karnavian, to talk a little bit, little bit about the, the, the Ahok affair, to, to just give us a window into some of the, the problematic dynamics that you are facing, uh, you have faced. Uh, during the Ahok affair, Minister Karnavian, you were actually the national uh, director of police, uh, and so you saw firsthand uh, the kinds of factors and trends uh, that uh, can be very damaging to the cause of religious freedom and tolerance uh, in uh, Indonesia. And so could you, from your vantage point, just describe what were the most important factors and trends that led to the Ahok affair? And would you also just tell us, what do you think is the danger that something like the Ahok affair could happen again? could happen in ways that would come back to damage the fabric of uh, pluralism and tolerance in Indonesia. Your Excellency. Uh, thank you, Dersha. Yes, I was, I was the chief of national, national police when, when uh, Hawk is uh, taking place in the year 2017. So in the case of an uh, Hawk, I don't think it is a problem, really the underlying, the most important problem is because of religious reasons. No, it is not. Number one is personality and number two is political contest. Being capitalized by political adversary. But my, this is a challenge, this is a real challenge to Indonesia today is that the rise of intolerance, intolerance, uh, intolerant groups or intolerant ideologies, particularly after the uh, reformation era. Well, it is good that Indonesia already adopting uh, democracy in today. You have got freedom, more freedom, freedom for, to do anything, everything, including in press, in media, human rights protections, then uh, civil society also stronger than before and many other aspects of democracy but apart from again the uh, classes of democracy uh, we have got also negative effects or negative sides of democracy in fact today in my personal opinion we are we are leading towards a western style democracy rather than Pancasila democracy, our unique democracy, Pancasila. We are moving towards that. No, number of indicators, you know, uh, showing we are moving towards a Western style democracy. Western style democracy is good, but if it is implemented in uh, a country, being dominated by low class, it could be, it could be counterproductive or it could be you have got a, a negative effect. Why? Because freedom, such as freedom of expression, you can, you can say anything, you can speak, you can express your idea as you want, then you are free to do so including freedom you know to embrace a specific strength of religion that has got inherent teachings of intolerance such as takfirism from it is not is it's not indonesian strand of islam of course being imported or being sent to Indonesia, whether it is uh, physically by people going there and back to Indonesia. And worse, since the advent of the technology of information, you have got cyberspace today, media, social media, internet, everything. So giving you a, an express way to send you know, the Middle East trend of, uh, well, 
violent, if you like, violent religion to get into Indonesia and spoil Indonesia, spoil Indonesia, such as takfirism. You have got terrorist, terrorist attacks. Uh, used to be the, the, the commander of detachment at the end, elite, elite of uh, counter-terrorism in Indonesia for some years. So interacting with those uh, being captured by us, more than 1,000, interviewing them, then uh, they've got different mindset of of Islam compared to 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 our in uh, to ours in Indonesia. So takfirism, Salafi jihadism, those you know uh, there are a number of teachings within within this religion that uh, in that is intolerant already to other religions. If you see that takfirism, I believe that all of you understand about takfirism that, you know, based on the concept of the oneness to the God, Tauhid. So anything not attributing to the, to the God being perceived as uh, forbidden or haram. So if it is, uh, uh, goods then uh, you are you can you can destroy them including the the kaaba they want to to destroy the, the holy kaaba then uh, even though you are muslim but not being part of the group then you are you are being being perceived as infidel or kafir then you are halal to be killed and so on so this is happening today in Indonesia. This, this sort of uh, Middle East strand of Islam. Well, I'm not saying that all Middle East, right? But well, definitely it is not. It is not indigenous uh, Islam. You know, it is Middle East strand of Islam coming to Indonesia, being introduced here. Then it spoil. It spoil our religions. Yeah. So you have got terrorism, not only terrorism, but they want to envision the establishment of the, the, the uh, Indonesia as an Islamic state. So, so if it is happening, of course, then uh, Indonesia can break up into a number of countries, right? Uh, it is true that uh, in Indonesia, Muslim is majority. But not all in not all provinces you have got Muslim as majority, such as in, again in Bali, Hindu is the majority. In Papua, I served as the chief of Papua for two years. Christian is majority. In Nusa Tenggara Timur, Christians, Nus, uh, Sulawesi Utara, North Sulawesi also Christian majority. What happened if Indonesia is uh, converted converted to be a Islamic state or Sharia being implemented in Indonesia, it is a breakup of the country. That's why we are, you know, keeping very much trying, uh, trying to do our best to keep the country intact. So this is the challenge of democracy, giving, opening the gate, very open, very wide, to uh, again the violent or intolerant strength of religion getting Indonesia and spoil Indonesians. This is our challenge. So what should we do next? I think we have got two choices. Number one is that we have to go back to our democracy, our own democracy, namely Pancasila democracy. This is also the very reason why our government today established a specific body, Badan Pembinaan Ideologi Pancasila. So uh, the body to cultivate the, the ideology of Pancasila, to reintroduce, intensify implementation of Pancasila, which is, which is likely now fading away, likely fading away. 
then moving towards the Western style democracy. Oh, well, I'm, I'm not saying that Western style democracy is bad, no, but it is, it is quite risky if it is abruptly, too abrupt being implemented in uh, a country, you know, where a low class is, dominant, is dominant. So like Indonesia, you know, so if that is number one, we go back to our Pancasila democracy, this is uh, the ideology that you know already unite us in a diverse country diverse society and already proven a number of times you know that it is uh, it's a good or strong foundation for us and of course this is also the reason why the, the government today we have got well even though we have got you have got pros and cons today that uh, you have got we have got a draft of uh, specific legislations to cultivate the uh, ideology of pancasila now it is already sent by the government to the parliament to be discussed in the next uh, future and the second the second option is that well we are moving towards a western style democracy that's okay it's quite difficult to go back to pancasila democracy pancasila democracy is remaining there mixed with the western style democracy but rule of law must be enforced and number two rule of law must be constructed particularly in relation to uh you know protecting really the uh, diversity of indonesia it is true that based on the iccpr in terms of government on civil and political rights the the most important document for freedom that the freedom of expression is without interference but there are a number of restrictions at least there are four must respect uh, the rights of others must respect the, the, you know, must keep the public order, must respect moral and attitude. Then also the, we have to keep up uh, our national security. ICCPR already stipulating very explicitly about restrictions that freedom is not absolute, but all restrictions must be ruled, must be regulated in the rule of law. So rule of law is really important, such as, uh, well, it is, not, it is not really actually banning people to express idea or banning people from making congregations, no. But it is very important, you know, otherwise, uh, our enemy, the, the intolerant people or intolerant religions, they can go freely and spoil. And it could be dangerous. Why? They could capitalize the low class, which could be easily to be infected by this sort of well dangerous religion, uh, religions. So again, there are two. We have got a challenge, and we have got two options: back to Pancasila demo democracy, or we are moving to uh, towards Western style democracy, like today. Pancasila remaining there but rule of law must be enforced and established. I think that's my idea, Dr. Shah. Terry Makassi, uh, th those were fascinating reflections. Uh, you made very compelling, uh, fascinating observations. You made a fascinating observation that perhaps the Ahok affair was really very unique and, and sui generis. You also made the observation that precisely as Indonesia becomes more open and democratic, there's a danger that some forces will take advantage of that openness to promote mm -hmm. intolerance. Uh, and I gather that there's some evidence, uh, and here I want to turn to uh, Robert Hefner and Ibu Alyssa, because both uh, Robert Hefner and Ibu Alyssa work extensively with young people uh, and, and observe young people uh, on university campuses and elsewhere. So I, I'd like to ask both of you just to comment 
on the observations that uh, uh, His Excellency Pogtito just made with respect to the danger that uh, groups, perhaps among young people, are taking advantage of uh, Indonesia's openness to promote intolerance. And maybe we'll start with you, uh, uh, Bob, and then we'll turn to Ibu Alisa. So, uh, okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, yes, uh, Patito pointed out uh, many, many aspects and many uh, development dynamics in Indonesia regarding the, the shifting of values, uh, the transformation of values to the direction that we are actually not really uh, wanting to happen in Indonesia. That is from, from substantive inclusivistic uh, practice of religion, especially Islam, into a more exclusivistic and legal formalistic practice of religion. And uh, this group is, uh, is, is, is uh, getting stronger and stronger. And actually Ahok's case was the tipping point for them to, uh, uh, I think I can use the term, go out of the closet, uh, get out of the closet and be out in the open with their agenda of formalizing uh, Islamic, um, Islamic uh, not Islamic values, but Islamic uh, rulings. And this is a challenge, but also actually in Indonesia, we also have a problem with majoritarianism. This is a simplification of democracy where the, uh, we feel like uh, because because we are the majority, then, then it is up to us to direct the local, especially at the local level. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is also an impact of uh, um, uh, what, I lost the word. Uh, an in impact of democratization and also direct elections at the local level. So now the majoritarianism uh, uh, paradigms is uh, actually living at the sub uh, at district level or regency level. That, for example, in Minahasa, we saw in January a group of Christian people uh, rejected uh, the, the building of a mosque because the majority of the people there are uh, Christians. And at the same time, in Karimun, we have the Muslims rejecting the rebuilding or renovating of the old uh, um, Catholic church out of majoritarianism. So the challenge is majoritarianism and uh, and also because Indonesia is a sociocentric society that relies on social harmony. And now the challenge, uh, I've, been, I've been speaking to uh, Patito's um, um, police department while Patito was still in office. Uh, I, uh, usually I talk about the paradigm of social harmony that is prioritized over constitutional rights. You know that democracy relies on constitutional rights, but the police officers and the local, uh, the local authority, usually they prefer to settle things uh, out with uh, the paradigm of social harmony. And that leads to the violation of the, uh, the 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 rights uh, the constitutional rights of the minority group and yes uh, dr shah uh, the, the 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 breeding the categorization of this exclusivistic and legal formalistic uh, practice of religion is actually based in university the process of not only instilling an ideology of uh, you can only practice Islam kafa if you have formalized the uh, in uh, the, the Islamic uh, law as the as the the uh, positive law in uh, in your life in your society that uh, that is um, instilled and organized uh, in university but also they have a very sophisticated program in categorization that leads to having a, a, a huge, a huge um, group of uh, movers and leaders. Uh, currently, they're everywhere, and that's why the change happened quicker when you already have uh, the cadres in place all over, 
all over society, not only in society, even in state uh, institutions. That's that's my take on that. Bob uh, can elaborate more. Actually, uh, Bob, uh, uh, Robert, please forgive me. I want to actually invite Mustafa to just make a quick comment. Uh, Mustafa is actually needing to break away because he's been invited to be on Fareed Zakaria on CNN uh, and oh. uh, needs, needs, to, needs to leave us very, very shortly. So I'd, li I'd like to give uh, you, Mustafa, uh, a, a word, a co comment on anything you'd like to say uh, before you have to uh, leave us. Thanks so much, Tim, and apologies for uh, leaving early to do another program I'm doing. Um, uh, I would be happy to hear His Excellency uh, Bananian uh, remarks on the Ahok affair being an example of you know, religious intolerance and sometimes being used for political goals. Uh, and that happens very often. <laughs> that happens in the Muslim world very often. That sometimes happens in the West, unfortunately especially in the past decades, there are people called populists, you know, and they want to depict the enemy, political enemy of theirs in the darkest terms uh, as infidels, as, uh, as spies, or as, as somehow people uh, religiously wrong, it's not just politically wrong, but also religiously, quintessentially, existentially, if you feel some in dark terms. And it might help them, you know, politically, but it doesn't help a society. So therefore, I think we should, when we see this kind of religious intolerance being used for a political agenda, we should have our red lights uh, and we should not buy into it, but we should be awake. Moreover, uh, also, I'm glad he mentioned sectarianism, which is yes. a huge problem uh, in the Muslim world at different levels. I mean, you know, in the very extreme level, it leads to groups like ISIS, Al-Qaeda, in other even mainstream interpretation sometimes it leads to silencing people, jailing people, uh, you know, uh, a very harsh cancel culture, if you will. Uh, and uh, well said. <laughs> also, I think, see the political element behind this, because whomever is doing takfirism is actually telling us, oh, that person is wrong, but I am. I, Islam is with me, the truth is with me, it's in my interpretation. Allah is with us, you know, and against them, and them are our enemies, and so on and so forth. So it's actually a self-glorifying message. Uh, and I think, again, that happens in every religious tradition, but we should be aware of that. There's one beautiful quote I love, uh, I mean, not from this one, from uh, or from uh, but Abraham Lincoln. Uh, U.S. president in the Civil War, uh, one of his supporters said, God is with us. And he said, I'm more concerned whether we are with God. In the sense that all those groups who come out and say Islam is the truth and we're presenting it and these people are cowpits and so on and so forth, they're glorifying themselves. We should ask them, are you sort of glorifying or not? Question your own behavior to the standards of the all believe. So I think uh, that distinction between the political salutary and the true values of religion is important everywhere, uh, especially in the Muslim world today, in other traditions as well. And I'm glad that these issues are being seriously discussed in Indonesia uh, and, and, and uh, blocks for uh, progress is being built. So uh, as a Muslim, uh, thank you. I mean, shukran uh, for, for, for having this uh, conversation and, and these, this beautiful progress. Hope to visit, inshallah. Uh, yeah. I, I'm sure I'll be okay compared to. <laughs> uh, but thank you. Thank you. Shukran, shukran to you, uh, Mustafa. Uh, uh, wonderful to have you. Uh, you're a stalwart defender of liberty for all, uh, and we salute you and we thank you for being part of the uh, this uh, conversation. We hope there'll be many more uh, on on this and uh, related topics, and look forward to having you back. All the best to you. Thank you. Thank you. And salam alaikum. Thank you. Uh, forgive, uh, forgive, forgive me, uh, uh, Robert Hefner. We uh, will turn to you now. And you, eager for your reflections on uh, on uh, Pak Tito's fascinating uh, thoughts just a moment ago, as well as uh, Ibu, uh, uh, Alyssa's comments. Well, I agree strongly with both of the statements that they both made, uh, beginning with uh, His Excellency uh, Babatito. 
I agree that the Ahok affair was a very troubling affair, but it should not be taken as the best illustration of what Indonesia is. Uh, uh, I did not know pa Ahok personally, but I followed his career. And, you know, he had a kind of, exactly as Pat Tito said, he had a kind of, in Indonesian, we say, blah, blah, and style, a very kind of blunt style. And uh, this offended some people. He was a good governor in some regards, in many regards, I think. He was a good man. But he, uh, you know, politics is also about what in Arabic is called adab, or uh, it's in, in Indonesian too, it's called adab, but also sopan santun. Sopan santun or means politeness. And there's a certain style of interaction in Indonesia that's considered very important. And perhaps, um, you know, in his bold manner, uh, sort of wasn't sufficiently responsive to that. He's a good man, but he did perhaps uh, misstep. But more importantly, to go on, and again, to also uh, support what uh, His Excellency Pa Tito said, I think if we look at how Indonesia healed, disembuhkan, after the Ahok affair, it's very, very really revealing. There was at first a great anxiety that this was a tipping point in the wrong direction. But when we look at how Nathat Ulama, but also Haider, uh, Nazir in Muhammadiyah, the, the head of Muhammadiyah, we see that there was a bold pushback and an effort to affirm, first of all, the point that Tito said earlier, that, and, and Bualisa, that Islam and nationalism in Indonesia are not antithetical. They actually mutually interact and enrich each other. And what this meant, I just this is one very specific point I think is important for people who don't know Indonesia outside. Many of the people who were attacking pa Ahok for the political reasons that pa Tito talked about were people who were more transnational in their understanding of Islam. They maniadaan cita cita kebangsaan. They denied and they just didn't love. If I may say so, if I may say so, uh, they didn't love the idea of Indonesia. This brings me to my third point, and this goes to what Bualisa said. There has been a generational change. Indonesia is developing so rapidly with new media, with globalization, with people traveling. Indonesians travel like I never imagined possible. They also study in different parts of the world. And this is bringing about a generational change, which is for the most part still very good. Very, very good. But inevitably, some among the new generation of people, particularly those who have traveled abroad and become more fascinated by certain transnational distant ideas than the idea and beauty of Kabangsa and Indonesia. Uh, there's, there is a certain percentage of them who, who no longer appreciate the traditions and the achievement and the remarkable beauty of this project of Hidu Bersama Sama, which is Indonesia. And there I think we, we can, I end just by saying the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Agama, the Ministry of Interior, are all working very hard with private groups like Ibu Alisa's Gusturian Network to really kind of remind people, not repress people, but remind people of the excellence and keistimewaan, the extraordinary achievement of nationalism in Indonesia, a nationalism that is inclusive because it's based on the Panchasila. It should not be. I agree with Pa. Tito, it doesn't have to, and it shouldn't be liberal in the Western, recent Western sense that emphasizes just individual rights. Individual rights are important, they're very important, but you have to, at the same time, have a love of country, a love of community, a respect for the reality of living together in a plural society. And that requires a little bit more. It requires the spirit of Kabangsaan, not just an affirmation, of liberal rights. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Robert. Uh, I want to uh, uh, turn, we have only a, a couple of minutes left. We actually are a little bit over time, but I wanted to uh, not end the discussion 
uh, until we had just a moment to talk about uh, possibilities for the future, prospects for building uh, the religious pluralism and tolerance that we've discussed. We've discussed the great foundations. We've discussed the great uh, uh, problems. Uh, but let's talk for a moment about the possibilities for strengthening uh, Indonesia's experiment in religious pluralism uh, and tolerance. And I'd like to actually uh, ask you, uh, Ibu Alyssa, uh, to talk a bit about the remarkable initiative that you have been working on with the Ministry of Religious Affairs. Uh, His Excellency uh, Patito uh, mentioned earlier the importance of the Ministry of Religious Affairs. Yep. Uh, 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 Bob, just a moment ago, also mentioned uh, the Ministry of Religious Affairs. You've played a central role, actually, in a new initiative, the Religious Moderation Initiative. If you just say, uh, just talk briefly about uh, this initiative mm-hmm. and its potential to advance, yep. not just hold the line, uh, not just preserve, but actually strengthen and expand mm-hmm. religious tolerance mm-hmm. and pluralism and freedom in Indonesia. That would be, I think, a wonderful uh, note on which to end the webinar. Yes, uh, I think Indonesia is blessed because uh, we are now uh, waking up and fighting hard to keep staying on track on pluralism and democracy and religious diversity, respect to uh, the many uh, religion and indigenous mm-hmm. religion. And now, even if not only this work is taken by the civil society or even the public themselves, who are not the silent majority anymore, uh, but the state is actually taking action. This is the, the, the good news that Indonesia, I think, has to offer the world. The state has put religious moderation perspective as a revitalizing perspective to be mainstreamed into state development program across ministries and institution. And uh, this is great news because we also acknowledge that we are uh, facing problems even uh, within the, the, the um, uh, state, um, the state actors themselves. So uh, bringing religious moderation to compete, to contest uh, the exclusivist, uh, exclusivistic and formalistic uh, practice of uh, religion is really something big. And also because it is put in the, <clears throat> sorry, in the uh, um, uh, middle, mid, midterm, uh, national development uh, strategic, uh, national strategy. And uh, the state offers a framework derived from the tradition of religiosity in Indonesia, which shows in um, five, uh, sorry, six characteristic. One, strong commitment of nationalism from different religion and uh, tolerant to the diversity of the nation, the anti, the peaceful and anti-violent uh, nature of practice, and the respect to tradition, even embracing local or indigenous tradition. And uh, the Ministry of Religious Affairs wanted to drive uh, the, the uh, what do you call, the, the, the practices of religion to this kind of practices that is the indigenous style of the Indonesian uh, religiosity. And this is, I think, uh, the greatest news. I'm, I'm happy with uh, with where we are right now in Indonesia, and hopefully we can still be the model of uh, religion and democracy strengthening one another. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, you, Alyssa. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Pak Robert Hefner. I'll always now think of you as <laughs> Pak Robert. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency, uh, uh, Pak Tito, Minister Kanavian. All of you were magnificent. Thanks again, of course, to Mustafa Akiel, who had to step away briefly. Uh, just indulge me for a moment if I just take a moment to thank one person uh, who is not on the panel, uh, but who really helped make this program possible. And that is Kiai Haji uh, Yaya Hulil Stakuf. Uh, everyone knows uh, Pak Yaya on this panel. Uh, of course, Pak Yaya has played an enormously important role as General Secretary of the Nadatul Ulama in promoting a vision of Islam Nusantara, it's a humanitarian Islam, the kind of Islam that we've talked about in the course of this discussion. And I'm delighted to say that Pak Yaya will appear on a uh, Religious Freedom Institute conversation in the coming weeks. Uh, to talk about what does Indonesian Islam uh, have to offer the world. And we expect to uh, record that and be able to broadcast that uh, right before the 75th anniversary of Indonesian independence. Uh, And finally, I again want to say I cannot say enough 
how honored we are uh, that you, uh, Your Excellency, Minister Kanavian, enjoyed us. You're, you've stayed up very late <laughs> to be part of our webinar. Uh, you were a robust and wonderful, uh, generous participant. Uh, you contributed so much from your extraordinary wealth of experience uh, and policy wisdom. We are convinced in the Religious Freedom Institute uh, that at, at a time when so many countries are moving in a very frightening direction, Indonesia has so much to teach the world, not just other Muslim countries, but, but other countries in Southeast Asia and South Asia. And we hope that this webinar will be a vehicle for opening the eyes of more people to Indonesia's remarkable record of religious freedom, pluralism, and tolerance, and will also serve to strengthen this great country's multi-religious democracy as it approaches the 75th anniversary of its independence. Uh, and finally, a big thank you to all of you who uh, are viewing this webinar, uh, uh, who have watched this launch of the Religious Freedom Institute's Indonesia Religious Freedom Landscape Report. Is Indonesia still a model of religious pluralism and tolerance? Again, you can download the full English version of the report for free through the RFI's website, www.rfi.org. And uh, those of you who are in Indonesia, uh, we are working very hard to make the report available in Indonesian as soon as possible. So to all of you, Terry Makasi, uh, happy Independence Day to uh, Indonesians who'll be watching this as uh, we approach August 17th. Uh, and please uh, stay tuned. Uh, for many more upcoming discussions, including discussions of Indonesia, but also discussions of religious freedom and tolerance and pluralism uh, in Indonesia, Southeast Asia, Southeast, South Asia, uh, and uh, the rest of the world. Thank you, Terry Makasi. Uh, God bless you, and thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs>